With just a little bit more spit and polish, Mario's Catastrophe Rebirth Edition could be released by Nintendo as a companion DLC alongside Super Mario World for the Nintendo Switch online service. The 2017 ROM hack by SNN takes the key and keyhole mechanic from Super Mario World and expands it into 27 levels of single-screen puzzle platforming alongside four optional challenge courses that you have to unlock. Rebirth Edition is a nice diversion that didn't consume all of my free time. The game uses lots of clever and ingenious mechanics that caused me to think very carefully. The challenge is not so hard that casual players will quit in frustration, although some platforming that I was required to perform created some odd difficulty spikes. If you like brain teasers and can stomach repeating a couple of tough platforming sections just to get the key to the keyhole, this ROM hack will probably be a lot of fun for you to play. So before we get too far into it, I just want you to know I'm not a Kaizo God. They actually scare me still. I don't have any special insight as to what makes a good game. These are just my opinions. What I really wanted to do was to make a place where newbies to the Mario community could find quality ROM hacks. I just had a lot of trouble doing that. So I wanted to provide that service for other people. So with that out of the way, let's get back to the review. The challenge of each puzzle lies in your knowledge of the general play mechanics of Super Mario World, as well as with experimenting with new mechanics that eventually come into play. You grab items, flip switches, toss shells, or perform any number of other actions to retrieve the key and then carry it to the keyhole. And if you get stumped or softlocked, pressing the L and R buttons together will completely reset the puzzle, allowing you to try again. The first puzzle is super easy and only exists to teach you the basics of how to play. Later puzzles do get harder and a couple of them had me thinking for nearly an hour. This can be a good thing, but sometimes the difficulty seems to suddenly spike in a way that made me feel like I'd missed a previous puzzle that was supposed to teach you something important about how to play later ones. After breezing through the first six puzzles, I sat stumped in frustration on the seventh for a good 40 minutes because the moving snake blocks, which was a mechanic that had appeared in a few previous puzzles, they were required to be used in a completely brand new way that the game never hinted at. I didn't notice any clues that implied that I could manipulate them outside of triggering them to start moving. And it seems to me an odd choice that the solution requires using snake blocks in a way that wasn't previously implied. But when I finally did figure it out, I was surprised that I ended up with the biggest grin on my face. I was happy that I'd solved the puzzle rather than just being happy that I'd never have to play it again. That's a huge point in favor of this game because I'm not the biggest fan of brain teaser games. I wanna quit whenever I get stuck instead of stopping to think about how the parts of the puzzle could relate to each other. So I was surprised to find that solving the puzzles that stumped and frustrated me mostly added to my enjoyment of the game and actually made me wanna keep playing, even with the seventh puzzle's odd solution. There was one notable exception, however. The hydrologic puzzle required me to perform a tricky Kaizo maneuver in order to solve it. It's easily my least favorite puzzle in the game. If you're a Kaizo novice like me, or are playing on any kind of emulator that introduces lag, like RetroArch on the SNES Classic, like me, then you can forget about easily getting the key into the keyhole, although it's possible because I did do it. In all but this puzzle, the input lag was not a factor, but here I was only happy because it was over. There's nothing more frustrating to me than knowing how to solve a puzzle, but being unable to because you can't do the platforming required. Thankfully, most puzzles are fairly laid back. There are perhaps three levels that increased my anxiety levels to uncomfortable highs due to a constant fear of dying to flames or failing a crucial platforming maneuver. In another game, that wouldn't be a bad thing, but it comes across as a disruptive change of pace here. At first glance, this game seems to be a very vanilla experience. That is, that it would just use assets and mechanics from Super Mario World. But before it hit the first required castle, it became extremely obvious that the mechanics that were being introduced in each were as chocolate as they come, which means that they didn't exist in the original Mario World. Most of the new mechanics are very thoughtfully designed. Mario's fireball melts ice blocks, a la Super Mario Bros. 3. When hit from below, the arrow blocks temporarily spawn up to three blocks in a row in the direction the arrow is pointing. There are red blocks that disappear as soon as Mario jumps off them, and resurrection blocks revive Mario if he touches them after he dies. 
There are timer blocks that appear in two different puzzles that pause falling platforms until Mario interacts with them, and they freeze all other physics for a small period of time before movement on those automatically resumes. When winding down with this game at the end of each day, I would always preview the next puzzle before I turned my SNES Classic off because of these and other inventive mechanics. I didn't want to wait until the next day to see what would challenge me next. And that's not just due to the mechanics, but also because of how they're used in conjunction with the original Mario World mechanics like block grabbing and shell tossing. They are mixed together in unique and surprising ways, making most puzzles different from each other. For example, using the original game's on-off switch to control the path of a moving thwimp between ice blocks was a delight and strongly reminded me of the ice block puzzles in Twilight Princess. And the way the game teaches you each chocolate mechanic is pretty classy too. Rather than ramping up in difficulty level by level, the difficulty curve is broken down by a mechanic. Each one is introduced with a single level to itself and a text box or two that helpfully explain what they are and how to use them. Many times there are one or two more levels after the first one that require even more careful thought about how to use that same mechanic to find a solution before another mechanic is introduced with a simple puzzle. This was especially evident when we got to the snow levels after one rather challenging course. The backgrounds and music are all custom, and I think they're from the SMW Central Library because I've heard some of them in other ROM hacks before, but I don't count this as a mark against it. The title screen music choice is rockin', and while none of the other music particularly stood out to me, other than some of it feeling familiar, none of it became grating after listening to it on loop. You'd also think that for a game composed entirely of single screen puzzles, that you'd be staring at a motionless monotony of static sprites for the majority of the time you're playing this game. But it's almost as if SNN anticipated this potential shortcoming because he added scrolling background and foreground layers to several levels. It's like he knew my eyeballs might dry out if I didn't have some movement on screen to help me refocus and blink from time to time, or at least to help make the puzzles feel more like regular Mario levels. Most of the game uses standard Mario World sprites, but there are plenty of custom ones as well. SNN made good selections here because each custom sprite and background feels like they fit in with the original game. The overworld map created by Koopster is also a beauty with lots of interesting features, colors, and no weird perspective issues. There's several times after completing a level where I honestly had no idea where the path would go because it literally sends you all over creation and in counterintuitive directions. There is no wasted space and no boring design here. It's one of the more varied and interesting overworlds I've seen to date. SNN also commissioned Medic to create an in-game timer for speedrunners that appears on the world map screen. But I'm not sure if it's considered legal if you want to appear on the game's leaderboard. Sadly, the game just ends when you finish the final puzzle. There's no credit sequence, just a Yoshi house with two text boxes. As a kid, I always wanted to see good credit sequences at the end of the games I played, and if the game had just a mediocre one, it just felt disappointing. To this day, Super Mario World's credit sequence is perhaps my all-time favorite because of the curtain call featuring all the enemies from the game. It would have been great to see something. Mario's Catastrophe Rebirth Edition offers some genuinely fun and unique puzzle platforming for nearly anyone who enjoyed Super Mario World and is into puzzle games. It's chock full of chocolate gameplay mechanics, which are utilized in clever ways, but it's still slightly rough around the edges by retail game standards due to no credit sequence and a couple of difficulty spikes. Yet the fact that I'm even comparing it to a retail game speaks volumes about the overall quality of each puzzle and that unquantifiable fun factor that makes it one of the best ROM hacks I've played. For more ROM hack reviews and playthroughs, subscribe! And then check out some more reviews by clicking on the playlist in the top left. For free SNES classic box art and emulator compatibility info for this game, check out swchris.com. And thanks for watching!